Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. Today we're going to cover a topic that people have been talking about in a few different regards and is timely to what is going on today, which is the process of cashing out of crypto. So most people who are kind of crypto OGs figure we're going to have a few months more, maybe a year, who knows, maybe a lot less uh, of bull run and so they're not ready to sell yet. But you need to prepare your infrastructure for when it is that you exit. And so the question is, if you have crypto, how is it that you best get out of it? So today we're gonna to go over some of the specific banks uh, in different parts of the world, my kind of experiences, uh, exchanges versus OTC desks, talking a little bit about that, uh, and you know any other concerns that you might have. So we were gonna dive into it now. Before we do, if we haven't, if you haven't already, please smash the subscribe button, nail the notification bell, make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. If you want any assistance with international structuring, international tax planning, uh, both the strategy and the implementation, please reach out to me. You can book a call, clarity.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer. There's a link in the description below. Or you can check out our websites, offshorecitizens.net and offshorecapitalist.com, and you can send us a message through there. All right, let's go. Okay, so there's a few different parts to this process if you're going to cash out. The first is, of course, you would convert typically from some sort of uh, crypto into some sort of stable coin. And if you're in some sort of Ethereum-based system, say on MetaMask or something like that, uh, it's you know, fairly simple because you can go to a DEX, uh, Decentralized Exchange, like Uniswap or SushiSwap or something like that, and you can utilize that in order to uh, uh, convert from whatever it is that you have in your ERC-20 tokens to stable coins like DAI or uh, USDT or something like that, right? If you're otherwise, maybe you're on an exchange and it's fairly simple to switch from something to something else on the exchange. Now, if you start dealing with a bunch of exchanges, for example, Binance, then there's limits on how much you can withdraw uh, both with a verified or an unverified account. So verified accounts have a limit of two Bitcoin per day. So approximately $120,000 $120, a day right now uh, that you can withdraw. Not the end of the world for a lot of people, you know, they could withdraw it in a reasonable period of time. When you start talking about, you know, high into the millions or deca millions, et cetera, it becomes a bit more of an issue. And at that point in time, you could have a verified account. A verified account allows you to withdraw 100 Bitcoins a day. So right now that's what, approximately uh, 5, million, uh, 5 million a day. So that's decent, right? A little over 5 million a day. So that's, that's not so bad. And then you can go beyond that in some cases. Now, in other cases, maybe you're holding it in a wallet, right? And you would use some sort of an OTC desk. So I tend to advise people when they're doing large transactions, large volumes of money, to use OTC desks. And so the one that I typically use, there are there's a bunch, you know, a lot of the major exchanges have them, for example, Gemini, et cetera. Uh, I tend to use QCP Capital out of Singapore. If you want an introduction, please reach out to me. I can connect you with them, uh, not a problem. Uh, but they've got, you know, pretty pretty amazing service and things are pretty good. Now the challenge with them is they have USD bank accounts. So if you need to do something with uh, say euros, they don't have euro bank accounts, that's sometimes a bit of an issue, okay? So that's that's one thing. Uh, but what you would do of course is you would just, you know, whether you can use a decentralized exchange or a centralized exchange or an OTC desk, you're gonna do some sort of a conversion into typically some sort of stable coin. Although in theory, you could go directly into fiat in some cases, right? Now you're holding that, uh, that fiat, okay, or some stable coin rather. Now what you have to do is you have to somehow get that into your bank account, right? So we have two parts to this. One is, okay, what banks are friendly? So let's go through, I mean, this is an, an ever-changing list and I find it depends a little bit on what it is that your objectives are in terms of where you're operating and uh, how it is that you've been accumulating those funds and what the volume of funds are, okay? So from a banking standpoint, I would say that in Singapore, the banks tend to be decent. UOB in particular, we have pretty good experience with. In Cook Islands, uh, the uh, uh, Capital Savings Bank or whatever it's called, uh, not a bank that I typically like to bank with, but uh, if you're willing to keep a deposit of about 20 grand in there, uh, they tend to be quite uh, crypto friendly. Uh, there's a bunch of banks in, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, in particular some of the EMIs that are crypto friendly. Uh, I find that generally the Canadian banks 
are pretty crypto friendly, not necessarily for uh, views of transactions going in or whatever, but I haven't had issues uh, with them in terms of just general, general transactions with exchanges, etc. And then I find that some of the US banks, uh, but in particular, if you can get it, Silvergate Bank is very crypto friendly. Uh, Bank Frick in Liechtenstein uh, is kind of known for dealing with crypto. There's a few banks in, uh, in Bahamas, in particular Deltec Bank, is, uh, is crypto friendly, but larger volumes, right? You're talking about, you know, million dollar uh, plus customers that you would deal with there. And then there's a couple in Cayman Islands that uh, can be fairly crypto friendly. There's others, uh, but, you know, that kind of covers off the baseline of what it is. Notably, most of the uh, like transfer wise and all those types of guys are not crypto friendly. So anyone who kind of has issues with high risk tend to be out of the picture. Okay. Now, beyond that, you would say, uh, okay, let's say you managed to get a bank account set up there, either in a company name or personal name, etc. Uh, can you receive the transfer? Well, you can't necessarily receive the transfer. So this is the thing that becomes the other issue, right? Is the bank may require some sort of uh, source of funds or proof of funds. And here, this is in my view, if you're dealing with larger amounts of money, arguably the most important thing. So I'm gonna give you a specific example. Uh, we deal with a few of the top Swiss banks and you know they offer very good service, they offer great products, they offer you know the typical things that you would need uh, if you're talking about non-transactional banking, right? You're talking about wealth management, et cetera, and they will allow you to withdraw if you can demonstrate the source of funds. So what does this mean for you? What this means is, first of all, uh, if you just bought, okay, you held and it went up over a long period of time, not a big deal. You can show the records, you can show where the money came in, where the money goes out, that's fine. Uh, if you're dealing with large amounts of money, they're willing to spend the time and effort to understand it. And I think that's a big difference between a small bank, like if you were to go to an EMI that just has a quick process where they're trying to be a low cost provider versus you know, a major wealth management provider. In the case of one of these, you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, great, their business is to help manage your wealth and you're gonna be a valuable client for them over a long period of time. Especially if you're in kind of the two to five million plus range, uh, you're a sufficiently valuable client that they're willing to go, okay, great, they'll put in the effort to understanding this. Uh, Morgan Stanley is, uh, is the same. Uh, there's a variety that are the same. So, okay, great, you do that, right? You're like, all right, I go and I, I go through this process. Uh, of showing it if I'm in that position. Now, if you're actively trading, then it's a little bit more complex, right? Because now in that position, you would want to ideally be able to show your trade logs, okay? If you can do that, again, shouldn't be a problem. It's a bunch of work to kind of show how the funds, you know, how the money changed and things like this, but you can at least show that it's a self-contained environment. If you're doing something that gets more complicated, like yield farming, staking, etc., cetera, mm, now, these things are pretty, uh, there's they're something that is just sufficiently new and it's not easy enough to track. There's some good tools that are starting to develop for this, but that it's tough to show. And so in those cases, you may start to have more issues and you may need to look at some different options. Additionally, if you're in a situation where uh, you had used it for transactions, so for instance, people are sending you crypto to pay bills or you're sending money out to pay bills, et cetera, now it starts to become a little bit more difficult as well because they have to try and verify where did that money come from and that's not gonna be easy for them. So I would say if you can do the first, great, perfect. If you can't, then you may have to look at some other options, right? In that particular situation, maybe that means you need to uh, break the money up into smaller pieces. Uh, maybe you need to be in a situation where uh, some of your other transactions, you transact directly in crypto. So for example, some brokers who are selling gold will allow you to buy gold in crypto. So that's something that's reasonable. Uh, sometimes there's something other else, some other investments that you might make and they're willing to accept uh, a crypto payment. So that's, again, we talk about citizenship sometimes. You can pay in ci for citizenships, et cetera. So those things might be workable for you depending on your situation, okay? What is there beyond that? Uh, beyond that, you can use uh, kind of indirect methods. Okay, what are indirect methods all about? Now, the, the problem with indirect, the indirect methods are like local Bitcoins, right? Now, usually getting volume here is tougher, right? You can do private transactions. There are people who will do pretty large private transactions for you. 
Uh, so that that is an option, possibly. If you you know you'll usually pay a fee for it, but you know it's worth it if you uh, if you need to get access to the money. And uh, then the question is, how does that get characterized on the receiving end, right? So sometimes that can be structured in a way that uh, because it's not coming directly from an exchange or an OTC desk or something like that. In, in my view, I would typically say money coming from an OTC uh, from an exchange is most likely to have issues. Money coming from an OTC desk is probably next less. And then uh, this third way, uh, kind of from some other individual or whatever, is going to be uh, less again because it might look more like an actual transaction as opposed to just withdrawing. Even though the, the, uh, the legitimacy of it could be fully legitimate and more so coming off the exchange, uh, just the ease of... The bank doesn't have the perception necessarily that it's crypto and therefore may not apply the same scrutiny. So these are all different things that you can do that may uh, may help you. So anyway, that's kind of a basic overview of ideas. This is kind of a high level explanation for you because the details do matter. The amount of effort that you may have to go through to demonstrate if you're talking about a large amount of money. Again, if it's a small amount of money, not such a big deal. Uh, but if it's you're talking about, you know, in the tens of millions or something, uh, that might be a bunch of effort to show where it came from. And so, yeah, there may be quite a bit of transactional history that you have to go through. Now, there is some software coming out. I have some friends and clients, people like this, who are working on technology to help basically do chain analysis to kind of show what took place. And that can also be a little bit helpful. So we'll see. Hopefully those tools are going to improve over time. And uh, if you would like help with this, either on the banking side, the structuring side, like what do you do once you get it, or in terms of actually like doing these transactions, please reach out to us. You can book a call, like I said, clarity.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer, link in the description below. Hit the subscribe button. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and let me know in the comments if you have any feedback, etc. And I'm gonna see you guys on the next video.